Hi there, this is Dr. Golding, and we are going to continue our discussion of John Stuart Mill and his theory known as utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is the theory that promotes the idea of the principle of utility. Okay, remember we talked about last time how Mill believes that there is a fundamental moral principle, that is to say a single rule which can theoretically be used in all circumstances to determine what is morally right or morally wrong, and that this fundamental moral principle that he believes in is called the principle of utility. And the principle of utility, I still have it on the board from last time, it says, given a set of options, when you're faced with any choice situation where you have different options about how to behave, that action which promotes the greatest amount of happiness in society at large, the greatest amount of social happiness is going to be the right action. Now, of course, some actions are going to be better than others, and some actions are going to be even really better, a lot better than other options that you might have. The more your action promotes social happiness, the better your action is. And the less your action promotes social happiness, the worse your action is. And if your action promotes unhappiness and promotes a lot of unhappiness in society, then your action is wrong and even wronger. So this is the principle of utility, and someone who believes that this is the fundamental moral principle is known as a utilitarian, or somebody who believes in utilitarianism. Now, last time we also talked about how, according to Mill, uh, he has a theory about what happiness is, right? We said that happiness, according to Mill, is pleasure. Pleasure is something that is readily identifiable, and the opposite of happiness or unhappiness is going to be pain. We know when we are experiencing pleasure, and we know when we are experiencing pain. So, according to Mill, this is what one ought to be doing. This is the foundation of morality. One ought to be trying to promote as much pleasure in society as possible, and trying not to promote pain in society as much as possible. Okay, now last time I mentioned that it turns out then that Mill believes in hedonism. Hedonism is the view that pleasure is what is good. Pleasure is what we want. Pleasure is what we should want. Pleasure is what we should promote. So in effect, it is correct to say that Mill believes in hedonism. And we had an objection to that. The objection which Mill himself considers is what well, this sounds animalistic, or dare I say, swinish. It sounds like, how could you be saying that the purpose of morality is to go around promoting pleasure, pleasure, pleasure? That is hedonistic, and surely a hedonistic uh, account of morality cannot be correct. Okay, so that's an objection that Mill considers. Um, so what we're going to do now is talk about Mill's response to that objection. Uh, I asked you to look at the text and see if you can find it. Maybe somebody found it. But basically, here's what Mill says to try to answer the objection. So Mill makes a distinction between two kinds of pleasure. He says that many people think there's only one kind of pleasure, but actually there are two kinds of pleasure. There's higher pleasures, And then there's lower pleasures. There's a, uh, there are many higher pleasures, as we'll see, and there's a lot of lower pleasures, but basically the idea is that there's a distinction between two kinds of pleasure, higher pleasure and lower pleasure. Now basically, 
The difference is that lower pleasures are pleasures that even animals can experience. They're basically pleasures that involve the body strictly. So the pleasures of eating and drinking, the physical pleasures that animals have in their bodily experiences, like human beings, those are what Mill refers to as lower pleasures. Now, higher pleasures are pleasures that essentially involve the mind. We could use the phrase mental pleasures versus physical pleasures. I think that's a good idea. There are physical pleasures and mental pleasures, but maybe a better way to say it is pleasures that involve the mind. So if a lower pleasure is, let's say, the pleasures of eating and drinking or experiencing a massage, what would an example of a mental pleasure be? A mental pleasure is a pleasure that involves the mind. So I'm going to give you a few examples of my own, and I think some examples that Mill would uh, give as well. Uh, a very simple mental pleasure might be something like the pleasure that you get from doing a crossword puzzle, or the pleasure you get from playing chess. That would be an example of a mental pleasure. When you do a crossword puzzle, or figure out a problem, some people enjoy brain teasers, that would be, uh, that would be an example <clears throat> excuse me, of a mental pleasure. Now, we could expand that, though, to the pleasure of reading a good book. Suppose you're reading a good book. When you're reading a good book, uh, it's not like you feel necessarily some physical pleasure coming over you, but you just enjoy reading the book. That's the way we speak. In fact, sometimes you'll say something like, or you'll, you'll hear somebody say, what a pleasure it was to read that book. I really enjoyed reading that book. It was a great book. I enjoyed it so much. Well, it's not a physical pleasure. It's not like the person is getting some kind of physical sensation of like their brain somehow getting massaged when they're reading a book, right? That doesn't happen. You don't even feel any physical sensations necessarily when you're reading a book. I mean, maybe if you're reading a book and you might, let's say at one point, while you're reading, you could, let's say, get goosebumps, or you feel like a certain thrill or a chill. But basically, when you're reading a book that you enjoy, you don't have any physical sensation. Now, you do have a physical sensation of reading. I mean, I guess you could say, well, that's your, the body's involved because you're using your eyes. So yes, the body is involved when you're reading a book. But there's a certain kind of pleasure you can get from reading a book, which is a mental pleasure as opposed to a physical pleasure. Now let's give some more examples uh, because it's really broader. Once you begin to think about it, you realize that there are um, other examples of mental pleasures. The pleasures of conversation, the pleasures of friendship, and the pleasures of genuine love. Okay? If you have a very good friend, you enjoy their company, you go out with them to movies, or you go with them to a uh, walk in the park, or you just spend time together conversing about things. I think a lot of people would say that they derive an immense amount of pleasure from friendship and from love. Now, of course, love could have a physical part to it, but it's not necessarily a physical pleasure that's involved in all kinds of love, okay? And so even if you're in love with someone romantically, there might be a certain physical dimension to the pleasure, but that's not the only part of the pleasure involved in a relationship of genuine love and affection. Now, there might be something you feel, you feel a certain sense of pleasure physically, but for the most part, it's really something that is not a physical pleasure, but rather something that is going on in your mind. So the pleasures of the mind include the pleasures of love, friendship, conversation. If you are going to a lecture or studying some topic that you really enjoy studying, that would be an example of basically a mental pleasure. Okay, so the higher pleasures 
I'm not writing this down on the board, but you could take this down if you like. The higher pleasures involve the mind. The lower pleasures involved only the body. Now you could probably imagine that you could have an experience that's involving both. I mean, let's suppose you're eating a delicious dinner while you're having a conversation with your friend or your beloved, your spouse or your girlfriend, your boyfriend. So you're enjoying a physical pleasure while you're enjoying also mental pleasure at the same time. That of course can happen. Um, but basically, the higher pleasures are pleasures that involve the mind, and the lower pleasures are pleasures that involve only the body. Now, there's something else going on here, because Mill is actually making a claim. Not only do we have two kinds of pleasure, but the mental pleasures are higher than the lower pleasures, and specifically, Mill says something else, and this is actually quite, I think, an extraordinary claim, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not true, but um, Mill claims that the higher pleasures are, I'm going to put this phrase over here, I hope you can see this, qualitatively superior. Qualitatively superior. In other words, the higher pleasures are qualitatively superior to the lower pleasures, as opposed to merely being quantitatively superior. Okay, so let's talk about this idea of qualitative superiority as opposed to quantitative superiority. Quantitative. I'm just going to put that phrase over here. Okay, quantitative superiority in a way is an easier concept. Uh, you know, for example, if I have five dollars and I compare that to a hundred dollars, obviously a hundred dollars is quantitatively more than five dollars. Okay. Um, now, if something's quantitatively superior, then basically it's the same kind of thing, there's just a lot more of it, right? It's money, five dollars is money, a hundred dollars is money, a thousand dollars is money. It's still money, but it's just more of the same. Okay, now, when we talk about pleasures, I think I mentioned this last time, that pleasures can come in degrees, right? So, for example, I mean, I could have, let's say, um, I'll use a very simple example. I could have, let's say I have um, a really small glass of a chocolate milkshake, okay? So I have this little glass of chocolate milkshake and I get a certain amount of pleasure from it, okay? But then I could have like a huge cup of chocolate milkshake. So you could say, okay, well, the pleasure I got from the huge cup of milk, milk, uh, chocolate milkshake is, is quantitatively more. I got more pleasure when I drank the big cup of milkshake as opposed to the small cup of milkshake. Okay, so that would be, again, quantitatively different, right? That I would have more quantitatively more pleasure drinking a big chocolate milkshake when compared to drinking a small chocolate milkshake. But now let's try something else. Still talking about food and quantitative uh, superiority. Suppose I have, um, I happen to really like chocolate milkshake. Let's suppose someone gives me a strawberry milkshake. So I have a little strawberry milkshake and then they say, hey, you know what? I have chocolate milkshake. You want some of that instead? I say, oh yeah, I'd rather have the chocolate milkshake. So now I drink the chocolate milkshake. I really like that a lot more. I get more pleasure out of the chocolate milkshake than I do out of the strawberry milkshake. Mill would say, but that's still a quantitative difference. You got more pleasure, but it was basically the same kind of pleasure, okay? Basically, you were still dealing with, in that case, let's call that a lower pleasure, because I'm drinking uh, a delicious taste of shake. So the 
Pleasure I get from drinking chocolate milkshake is quantitatively more. Again, now in my example, I'm talking about where you have the amount. Suppose you have the exact same amount. I have a little cup of strawberry milkshake. I like it. But comparing that to a same amount size of chocolate milkshake, I really like that. So but it's the same kind of pleasure. It's just that I got more pleasure out of the chocolate milkshake than the strawberry milkshake. Okay, all of that is a quantitative difference. So within lower pleasures, there are quantitative differences. You can have more or less of a certain lower pleasure. Now what Mill is claiming is that the higher pleasures, which we said before were basically pleasures of the mind, are qualitatively superior to the lower pleasures. Now, when he says qualitatively superior, what he means is that the pleasure is qualitatively superior. The pleasure that one gets from the mental pleasures is a better kind of pleasure. It's like on a different plane. It's in other words, qualitatively superior in effect means that even if you had a lot of that lower pleasure, if you had a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot, it still would not reach the level of a mental pleasure. It's like two different kinds of things. So, for example, he seems to say, he says this, this is what qualitative, superior, uh, qualitative superiority means. Even a small amount of the lower kind, I'm sorry, let me say this again. Even a small amount of the higher kind is going to be more pleasurable than a lot of the lower kind. Um, the pleasure that I get from conversation, if I really get a pleasure, if I'm having an unpleasant conversation, it's not going to be pleasurable. I'm not saying we shouldn't make a mistake and think that Mill is going to claim that all conversations, that all books are, you know, uh, mentally pleasurable. If you're reading a boring book or you're having a conversation with an enemy or a fight, that's not pleasurable. Okay. But we're talking about certain kinds of conversations, certain kinds of books that you happen to enjoy, okay? Then that's gonna be a mental pleasure for you. And the pleasure that you get from those mental activities that you do enjoy are going to be qualitatively superior to the lower pleasures. And in a very famous uh, statement, Mill says that Socrates dissatisfied is better. I'd rather be Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Famous statement. I'd rather be Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. What does that mean? He's thinking like this. Pigs are only capable of physical pleasures. And Socrates is just an example used of a man who was very intellectual and used his mind. Okay, so Socrates dissatisfied, I'd rather be Socrates dissatisfied because at least I would be having mental pleasures and the physical pleasures don't matter as much to me as the uh, mental pleasures do. And so therefore I would rather be Socrates dissatisfied, meaning Socrates having some physical pain rather than being a pig who doesn't have a mind or doesn't have much of a mental life, um, uh, even though the pig is, let's say, rolling around in the dirt and is, is having physical sensations of pleasure. Now, I do want to make a little footnote here, which is that um, it's really not that important to the theory that animal, he's not saying that he is kind of intimating that animals don't have mental pleasures, but one could easily modify uh, what Mill says about animals um, to agree that animals also can have some level of mental pleasures. I mean, if you think about dogs, uh, dolphins, uh, even cats, they engage in play. 
right? They play. And when you play, uh, again, the pleasure, I should have mentioned that before, probably as an example of a mental pleasure, sports, okay? Sports, we, many of us enjoy playing a sport. Many of us enjoy watching a sport. When you go to a ball game and watch a game uh, that you enjoy, there might be some physical aspect to it, but mostly it's a mental pleasure, right? In fact, if you are an athlete and you're performing in a competition, it could actually be physically painful and exhausting to be playing in some very uh, you know, competitive sport. Um, and you could be playing through the pain. Let's suppose you get a little injury and you still play the game because you want to win. So um, perhaps that, that adds, actually that reminds me of another point, which is uh, achievements is a kind of mental pleasure. We do, and that's maybe related to uh, problem solving. When you do a crossword puzzle or solve a brain teaser, work on it, get through it, and you solve it, you, that's when you kind of get that sense of accomplishment, which is a mental pleasure. Anyway, I was uh, digressed a little bit. My point was about animals. Mill could easily agree that dogs, dolphins, maybe even pigs have been mischaracterized. It's quite possible that some, of, some animals do engage in these so-called mental pleasures, pleasures of friendship, pleasures of play. Cats seem to enjoy playing uh, with a ball or something like that, definitely dogs. So it's not a big deal if we admit that some animals maybe uh, do have mental pleasures. Um, still, the point it remains, uh, the main point is that there's two kinds of pleasures. There's the physical pleasures, which are lower, and then there's the mental pleasures, which are qualitatively superior to the physical pleasures, such that they're on a different plane. Even a little bit of mental pleasure is going to be more pleasurable, not quantitatively, but the kind of pleasure that it is, is just on a different level than the so-called lower or physical pleasures. Okay, now, since there's two, let's go back. Remember the objection was, hey, this is a hedonistic theory. You're saying that people should be just indulging in pleasure, that the purpose of morality is to promote pleasure? Well, Mill says, yes. You know what, people who make that objection, they're thinking only of the lower pleasures. If all we had was lower pleasures, then you're right. This would be kind of like a, let's call it animalistic or swinish theory. But it's not because there are higher pleasures. And by the way, we should also talk a little bit about, we said there's two kinds of pleasure. There's also two kinds of pain, okay? There's two kinds of pain, similarly, as well, because there's going to be lower pains, meaning physical pains, which are bad and they're unpleasant, right? Physical pain is not fun, it's bad, but there's higher kinds of pain, meaning more intense kinds of pain, like for example, grief and sorrow, okay? When you are frustrated and angry, or when you are uh, in grief, or you're very sad, or even a little sad, okay? There might be some physical symptoms, and generally there are physical symptoms to grief and sadness. You feel down, you feel tired, you feel draggy, but if you hear about the loss of a friend, unfortunately, or the loss of a loved one, uh, it's not really a physical pain. It's a mental pain of a certain sort. It's grief. You might call it emotional if you want to. You can say it's an emotion um, that is that is hard to deal with, that is painful, I feel very bad. And you, there's, there's some kind of a physical um, symptom to feeling bad, but basically it's something that's going on in your mind rather than in your body. So um, what's worse, causing physical pain or causing mental anguish and grief? According to Mill, it would have to be causing grief. Causing mental pain is actually worse than causing physical pain. I mean, they're both bad and you shouldn't do either one. And similarly, going back now to pleasure, remember the objection. The objection was, hey, this is hedonistic. What are you talking about? This is the purpose of morality is to go around promoting 
pleasure. I mean, it sounds like Mill is endorsing having orgies all the time and just drinking and eating. No, 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 no. That's all just all about physical pleasure. What we're really after in life, what we really want, what's really, truly the better kind of pleasure. Why is it better? Because it's more pleasurable is mental pleasure. So we should be promoting friendship. We should be promoting love. We should be going around making people feel better mentally, psychologically, as well as helping people with their various uh, physical needs, okay? Now, in some cases, you know, of course, if, if you're starving and you're hungry and you haven't had anything to eat all day, it's kind of hard to sit there and read a book or go to a lecture or uh, have a conversation with a friend because you're starving. So um, physical needs, in order to achieve even the promotion of um, mental pleasures, we uh, may also need to supply ourselves and those around us with our basic necessities, okay? Uh, obviously, you can't live without food, even though you can live, at least for some period of time, without books, without conversation. So there's a subtle point here. Physical needs, in a way, have to be, the basic physical needs have to be met in order for us to be able to experience the higher pleasures. Um, however, that still doesn't take away from the fact that those pleasures of conversation, pleasures of reading, pleasures of friendship, still are more pleasurable than the physical pleasures. At least that is what Mill is claiming. But this is again how Mill gets around the objection of uh, that his theory is hedonistic. You're only thinking of one kind of pleasure, there's higher pleasures, therefore my theory is not animalistic even though it still is hedonistic. He's still promoting the idea that pleasure is what it's all about, but not just physical pleasure, mental pleasure, and mental pleasure is superior in its quality to physical pleasures. So that is his answer to the question. Now, um, there's a lot to talk about here in terms of well, should we agree with this or not? And if this were a live class, I would be posing to the class the question of, do you agree that, first of all, that there are these two kinds of pleasures, and second of all, that the mental pleasures are actually better pleasures, higher pleasures than the lower ones, and not only are they better, but they're qualitatively superior, such that even one little amount of the higher pleasure should be better in its pleasure to lower pleasures. Mill does add something here that's important uh, to bring out, which is he says as follows, how do I know? How do I know that there are these two kinds of pleasures? And how do I know? Why am I claiming that the higher pleasures are qualitatively superior to the lower pleasures? Why am I claiming this? What's my basis? The answer is, he says in the text, if you ask people who have experienced both forms of pleasure, which is basically you and me, I hope, we've experienced both kinds of pleasures. If you ask people who have experienced both kinds of pleasures, they will tell you that the mental pleasures are higher than the physical pleasures. They will tell you that from their own experience, enjoying reading a good book, enjoying the pleasures of conversation, are qualitatively superior to the physical pleasures. That's his argument. And um, I think, again, at this point, we should reflect, and again, if this were a live class, we'd probably have a nice little discussion here about whether um, you think that the mental pleasures are higher, actually, than the physical pleasures, uh, are they always preferable? That's what Mill seems to be claiming, is that at any moment when you have a choice between two pleasures, one's a physical, one's a mental, you would prefer the mental pleasure over the physical pleasure. So here, a lot of people would object that this is just not really true. 
that there may be, there are times when many people prefer a physical pleasure over a mental pleasure. Um, and you can think of your own examples of that. And how would Mill explain why that's happening? Um, now, you know, sometimes people, you might think, oh, well, I can think of an example where, where uh, I, I, I often prefer a physical pleasure over a mental pleasure. For example, let's suppose uh, I come home late at night from a long day at work and I'm tired and exhausted and I'm hungry. And I see two things on the table that my wife or my friend, my other, has put on the table for me. I see my favorite book, okay? My, my book of ethics, my Aristotle and Mill uh, collection over there. And on the other side of the table, I see a delicious dinner waiting for me to eat. And I come in, what am I going to prefer? Well, if I'm tired and I'm hungry and I've been, you know, at work all day and I come into my house and I see the book on one side and the delicious meal on the other side, surely I'm going to prefer the uh, delicious meal over the book. So what's going on? Isn't that a case where I've just managed to prefer a physical pleasure over a mental pleasure? So I think with that kind of example, Mill might have an answer. Uh, his answer could be that when you're in that state, where you're tired, you're hungry, you're exhausted, you're just not up to reading the book, okay? You're not up to reading the book because you're hungry and you need, you need to eat in order to feel good and then later on, Maybe after you've eaten and you've relaxed a little while, you need a little R&R. &R. We all need some rest and relaxation. Uh, we all need to eat basic, you know, food and drink. We have to have our basic, I said this before, we have to have our basic needs met in order to be able to even appreciate reading Aristotle. But that doesn't mean that the pleasure that you get from the eating is actually a better pleasure than the pleasure you get from reading the book, okay? It's maybe similar to the case of where, let's suppose I need to get an injection of some sort to make me uh, immune to some virus that's floating around, okay? So the injection is painful. I don't really enjoy having an injection. I don't really want the, uh, the pain of the injection but I need to do it because uh, in the long run, it's gonna make me be able to enjoy life and not die. Okay, so maybe something like that is what's going on here. You're not really, in that situation, you're not comparing this, the, the, the comparison is not a fair one because you need to eat and drink in order to be able to even begin to, to read the book. So, but that doesn't show that the pleasure of the eating is actually a better pleasure. Uh, it just shows that it's necessary for your body to function. And so therefore, then you'll be able afterward to enjoy the book better than uh, you would otherwise. All right, well, again, uh, you might think about whether, uh, I, I'll just tell you what, what, what I think maybe Mill could have said a little differently. He could have said, look, the fact is there's two kinds of pleasure. Now maybe we don't always prefer mental pleasures to physical pleasures. There are some times, there are some people who every so often they uh, prefer the physical to the mental for whatever reason. But the fact is that we have two kinds of pleasure. We have the mental pleasures and we have the physical pleasures. And maybe that's already enough to get him out of the objection that this is an animalistic theory. Perhaps that is enough. Now, while we're on the topic of pleasure, I think what I'd like to do is spend a few more minutes talking about how Aristotle, or someone like Aristotle, might respond to Mill's claim that essentially happiness is pleasure, whether it's physical or mental, okay? So let me erase this for a moment.
Um, this is what Mill is essentially saying, right? He's saying that happiness equals pleasure. And then we have to keep in mind that there's physical and mental pleasure. So it's not just pleasures of the body, but it's still pleasures of the mind that are part of a happy life. So here is what Aristotle or someone like Aristotle might say, because remember that Aristotle believed in the pursuit of happiness, right? Remember, happiness, according to Aristotle, is the highest good. Happiness is the telos of the human being. It's the purpose and the goal for which we, by nature, are designed to achieve. And um, according to Aristotle, virtue is really desirable. We should be virtuous because if we're virtuous, that's going to help us reach our telos. So there's a lot in a way that, that Aristotle and Mill agree on. They agree that in some sense, happiness is the goal, and being virtuous is going to help us reach happiness. Okay, um, but this is what, what Aristotle disagrees with this, right? Aristotle says, happiness is not the same thing as pleasure. So how would Aristotle respond to Mill? He would say, well, first of all, of course, he disagrees. He disagrees with Mill. Um, this, by the way, is a plus sign, okay? And that was, if that was confusing. Physical plus mental pleasure, okay. So Mill says that happiness is the same thing as pleasure. Aristotle would say, no, they're not the same thing. Um, I wanna give you a couple of reasons, maybe give you like three little reasons for thinking that um, happiness is not identical with pleasure, okay? And the first is that pleasure is a sensation. Happiness is a condition of being. Maybe I'll write that on the board. Here's reason number one. Now, these are, again, these are reasons that Aristotle would give to disagree with Mill. Number one, happiness... is a condition of one's being. That's a semicolon. Pleasure is a sensation. Okay, in other words, a sensation is something that comes and then it goes. Like if you have a sensation of fear, because let's say there's a dog approaching you that looks rabid and it's barking, so you get afraid and then you run away and then your fear dissipates. So you had a sensation of fear. So a sensation is something that you experience, you're aware of it when it happens, and it lasts for a certain period of time and then it goes away. Okay, that's what pleasure, and by the way, the same thing is true of pain. Pain involves a sensation. I mean, you could, unfortunately, some people have pain that's persistent all the time, but then it's still, it has a duration, right? It, du it has duration through time. Okay, um, and often it does come to an end, pleasure also. Aristotle says, look, that's not what happiness is. Happiness isn't an experience or a sensation. Happiness is a condition of your very being. Therefore, they're not the same thing. So that's number one. Uh, what would Mill say about this? Mill would say, no, 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 that's not true. Or he would say something like, yeah, happiness is a sensation. I think happiness is a sensation. Okay, well, Aristotle would say that it doesn't seem to be correct. Happiness is a condition of one's being, much deeper than just a passing feeling or a sensation. Um, here's another reason 
for thinking that maybe Aristotle was right. Here's, so here's reason number two, is that um, one can doubt, one can reasonably doubt says doubt if one is happy semicolon one cannot doubt it doesn't make sense one cannot doubt if one is serious if one is experiencing pleasure One is experiencing pleasure. Okay, in other words, what, what this is saying is, I can ask you to think about, are you happy? Write an essay discussing whether you are a happy person. And you can sit there and think about, you know, maybe I am happy because of this and this and this. Maybe I'm not happy because of this and this. And you can introspect and try to figure out whether you're happy or not. And even if you wrote the essay, you might come at the conclusion of the essay, you might come to the conclusion that I think I'm happy, but I'm really not sure I'm happy. All of that makes sense. But it doesn't make sense, Aristotle would say, to wonder whether you are undergoing pleasure or not. Are you having pleasure now? Are you experiencing pleasure? Hmm, I don't know. Well, if you don't know, then you're not. If you don't know that you are undergoing pleasure, then you're not undergoing pleasure. It's the same thing true of pain. If there's a pain that you have that you're not aware of, if you're not aware of it, again, pleasure and pain are sensations. So if you're undergoing, I mean, I guess you could maybe, Aristotle would agree, if it's a very, 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 very mild pain, you can sort of forget about it. Like, so I have like various aches and pains. I have a pain in my shoulder. That, you know, sometimes I don't, am I aware of it? Well, once I start talking or lecturing or thinking, walking in the park, I have to kind of forget about my pain, but it's still there. Okay, a very, very mild pain or a very, very mild, mild pleasure, you could sort of have it, but not be aware of it. But basically, um, in general, pleasures are things that you are aware of and pains that you are, are things that you are aware of. And it would not make sense to wonder whether or not you are having pleasure now. Because if you're wondering, then clearly you're not having pleasure. But it does make sense to reasonably doubt whether you're happy or not. So if that's correct, that shows that happiness and pleasure are not identical. They might be related in some way, but they are not identical. And I'll give you a third reason for thinking that, I just need to make a little more room, I think I'm going to erase this. And here's reason number three that could be given, again, these are reasons to think that Mill is wrong and that Aristotle is right, that happiness is not the same thing as pleasure. Reason number three is that, I'll write this on the board, one can uh, be experiencing pleasure experiencing having a sensation of pleasure and still be unhappy. Unhappy. Okay, this can happen from time to time. You might be, let's say, at a dinner party and you're having a sumptuous meal and you're drinking wine and you're eating and there's friends around you and you're having pleasure but somehow there's something missing in your life, you're unhappy, you're unfulfilled, um, that if that's possible, that you can both undergo pleasure and at the same time be uh, 
unhappy, then that would seem to mean that happiness and pleasure are not the same thing. Now, I think that, again, these are three reasons for thinking that Aristotle is correct, happiness is what we want, and in some way, even perhaps, Aristotle is right that morality or virtue is what we need in order to get to happiness. That's really another point. Um, Mill thinks that happiness is the same thing as pleasure. I do want to say, with regard to these three reasons, that um, Mill could say this one, at least, um, this one's a little bit unfair because the example I gave you, well, is that really a fair way of criticizing Mill? If someone's under good memory, Mill believes in mental pleasure, right? And so Mill could say something like, you could be undergoing a physical pleasure, but you're lacking some kind of mental pleasure that would be making you uh, happy. Okay, so let's say you're lonely. Let's, okay, let's suppose you don't have love in your life, or you don't have friends, or you have acquaintances, but they're not really friends. They're just people that you sort of know, but you don't really have a deep relationship with them. So that would easily explain how you could be experiencing some pleasure and still be unhappy because you would have some amount of physical pleasure, let's suppose, or some mental pleasures, but somehow something's missing in your mental pleasure, in your mental life, that you would really enjoy. And then if you have that, that would make you happy. Okay, at any rate, you can develop, I hope, your own opinion about what you think about whether happiness is or is not the same thing as pleasure. We've talked about the idea of physical pleasures and mental pleasures. Um, I think we've done quite a lot for one session. And uh, next time we'll go on to talk more about the principle of utility, some questions and problems that arise with the principle of utility, how it should be put into practice. And we'll go on with Mill for probably another two sessions at least. I hope you're well, stay well and healthy, and have a great weekend. Bye.